But uh, on July 1st of this uh, month, um, I spoke and um, I read three, three reasons that the Dutch Sheets gave for why we're in a new era. And um, one of the reasons was that the, a remnant of the church is embracing its role, seeing its role and embracing it as the ecclesia or the government of Christ's kingdom. See, the church is all these things that we've been, those of us raised up in the church or have been in the church for a while, we know what the church, there's many things the church is called to be and to do in a family, in a community, in a hospital for the sick and the sinners. And we, yes, it's all that. But somewhere along the line, we miss the fact that Jesus established in, Mar, uh, in uh, Matthew 16 an ecclesia or governing body that he said, I will give this body the keys of the kingdom. And they're going to legislate so that the gates of hell or the resistance or the authority of, of hell cannot have its way in the realm where the church steps up and embraces its authority. So one of the reasons Dutch said we're entering into this era is because a remnant of the church is buying into that. They're seeing that. And they're beginning to walk in a newfound authority from that and beginning to tap into heaven's initiatives and declare them into the earth. Bill Johnson says nothing happens in the kingdom without a declaration. And I put that on him, I quote him on that, because I'm just not sure that it's 100% that way. But he says nothing happens in the kingdom without a declaration. Somebody in the earth needs to declare the will of God. I know that there's enough of it that way that I'm not going to argue with him. So uh, the second thing that um, Dutch mentioned was that um, the earth's, uh, the world's condition is so desperate that it's primed to receive the gospel of the kingdom. There's a, there's a lack of solutions, a lack of answers, and uh, so much uh, hardship and destruction that they're, they're sitting on the verge of a massive, massive revival that will sweep thousands upon thousands, some say billions of souls into the kingdom of God. He believes we're at that point. This morning I watched uh, Victoria Osteen open up their, their uh, service from last night, their Saturday night service. And she told of how they had held uh, a, a, a 2 o'clock and a 7 o'clock service in Brooklyn, New York on Friday. And how many know who Joel Osteen is? Who doesn't know? You know he carries, he's probably the apostle of hope. I mean, he carries a hope message. That's what he preaches. He doesn't apologize for it. And many people are, have been blessed because of his, uh, his dedication to run in the lane God put before him. And they're holding the service, these two services, and he gives an opportunity for people to either rededicate to Christ or to come to Jesus for the first time. And in two Friday services in this Colosseum, 20,000 plus people stood to their feet to receive Christ. 20,000 on one day. Joel Osteen doesn't claim to be an evangelist. I mean, he's just preaching what God tells him to preach. But people who need hope are responding to a Savior and a Lord who can give them a, a future and a hope, Jeremiah 29, 11. And so we're actually seeing this. We're going to see more and more stadiums filled with people. I'm amazed. I thought most, mostly it would be the church that would support him. You know, just saved people coming and just wanting to have a good night of worship, and that's wonderful. But she said she thought 80% in both services stood up to receive Christ or come back to Christ, over 80%. One guy, one pastor that was there said it was 90%. So Scott is doing something. Number one, when they interviewed some of the people after it, they said, why are you here? They said, well, we quit going to church because we heard what we couldn't do. You can't do this. You can't. But Joe tells us what we can do. I'm going, come on. Sinners are being drawn to a message of hope and empowerment 
in Jesus Christ and uh, responding to it. And so this is just this is just going to grow and grow and grow. <coughs> Excuse me, but it was confirmation for what Dutch was saying. The third thing he said about the reason he believes we're in a new era, I want to expand on, but I'll quote what he said. He said, for the first time in many centuries, the church will be able to function in all of the five gifts and anointings Christ gave her. The apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, and the teacher, according to Ephesians 4.11. And this it is important. And this important passage goes on to say that through these gifts, the church will be able to reveal the fullness of Christ in verse 13. So if we're the body of Christ and what we could accurately present to the world of Christ hinges on how we've embraced what the grace gifts that Christ gave to the church as he ascended, Ephesians 4, if, if, it, if our presentation of Christ has been affected by that, limited by that, then because a remnant of the church is saying we believe that the five-fold ministry is for today, all of it, not three or four gifts, five gifts. And so because a remnant of the church is buying into that and saying we want to see that, we want that to, we want that to flow, we want that to happen, then there's becoming an opportunity for the body of Christ to more accurately reveal Christ. I don't know anybody that has all five gifts functioning. I know that I can prophesy at times, but I'm not a, pro a, a prophetic grace gift. They see the world through certain eyes. Evangelists see the world through certain eyes. Everybody can evangelize, but you may not be an evangelist. Everybody can uh, be compassionate and pastor, but you may not be called to be a pastor. They see the world, they see people, they see situations through certain eyes because they've been graced with that gift to bless the body of Christ and to, for the body of Christ to bless the world. Um, sometimes I go through the list and I say an evangelist sees souls to be saved. I don't care if there's two people in the room. One might be away from God, you know. They're both Christians all their lives, but one might be away from God. If he sees 200 in the room, Surely he knows there's some that are not saved. <coughs> it's just the way he views things. Teacher looks at you and he sees students. If he can just teach them what that word really means in the Greek, my God, they'll get victory. He sees students to be taught. The prophet sees saints with a destiny. Dan gets up here and he starts calling out, you know, you've got a future and you've got a destiny and you've got power. You can overcome the devil. And, and uh, he, he sees saints. The, um, the pastor sees sheep to be shepherded, all the needs of the people, gather them together. If I can just get them all together and, and nurse them uh, to health and, uh, and, and, and gather them, and they're big about gathering, you know, what we can do to get more in the building and get bigger buildings. And, and sheep like to gather. And so the, bigger, the biggest ministries are, are, are uh, led by great pastors. And, and sheep like their pastor. And uh, so the pastor gift, gift sees things a certain way. The apostle gift, which I have more of that, and uh, they see soldiers. They see battles to be won. They see ground to be taken. They see the kingdom of God coming to earth and it manifesting supernaturally in the realms that they influence. If I lead a church and there's nothing supernatural going on, I'm quitting. Because I, got, I don't just want to see the resources of all the people gathered together and their talents and what you can accomplish just with all of that naturally. I want to see something that has got to be God. And, and, and using all of us together. So uh, the advancing of the kingdom is uh, what the apostle tends to look at. Is, is this happening with what we're doing? Is the kingdom increasing? and affecting the realms that we influence. <coughs> so the, um, the uh, apostolic gift is being, let me back up and say this. At one time, um, a little over 500 years ago, the church had degenerated 
into a uh, uh, Nicolaitan model of ministry where the clergy ruled the laity. Martin Luther comes along, nails his 95 Thesis to the door of the Wittenberg Church, and the Reformation explodes on the scene, and through the 500 years, God's been restoring to His church the teacher, the pastor, <clears throat> the evangelist, and to an extent, the prophet. The church has, has bought into that, different levels, different limi limitations on it. <clears throat> but 40 or 50 years ago, William Brown and certain Paul Cain, certain men moved in such a powerful prophetic gift, they had to admit the, the, prophet, the prophetic office is for today. The era we're in now, we're really at the beginning stages of God restoring the apostolic gift to the church. And just like if you go back in church history and look, just like whenever those gifts were restored, there's confusion, there's um, suspicion, there's even persecution. And the, the, the strange thing is, it comes from the group that was restored before the one being restored now. The church itself rises up in resistance. And, uh, and that's happening some now. You can go to, because we have um, Google, you can Google the New Apostolic Reformation, which is a, a term the late Peter Wagner gave it in the 90s, and it's kind of stuck. But you can Google that, and there are horror stories about the Bill Johnsons and the Che uh, Ons and, the, and the, um, anyone that believes the fivefold is for today is lumped into the new apostolic reformation movement, and it's sweeping the world, and it's dangerous, and you've got to avoid it, and it's crazy, and there's a lot of controversy and a lot of resistance to it. How they get around... Ephesians 4.11, where there are apostles given to the church, how they get around. I'm, I'm not saying I know how it all fits together. I'm just saying we've got to start with the fact that it's a legitimate grace give, given to the church just like the pastor and the teacher and the evangelist and the prophet. So we start there and we say, okay, how does all this fit together? Lord, what are you saying? What are you doing in your church? How can we make all this work? Because we know you gave it because we needed it. You didn't just give it to to confuse us. So, so we're going there. This is the, 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 uh, really the, uh, the reason I say we're in the early stages is because some of the language is still new. We're still developing terms for what it means uh, to be uh, an, a church that emphasizes the apostolic view of the world. They're called apostolic centers or, or kingdom centers or spirit training centers. They're not called churches. And, and there's, there's just terms that are developing for how we can explain some of the things that are being emphasized now uh, by the Lord. And then there's, uh, like with every uh, move of God or um, thing that, that is legitimate, there's the counterfeit and there's the abuses of it. And it just throws gas on the fire for those who want to accuse <coughs> and say it's not for today. Or say it's of the devil. I went from um, looking at uh, Victoria Osteen's testimony of thousands of souls being saved the day before, and I, I just went over another page, and there was at the top of the page another Christian pastor who has a, a massive church, and he's, he's given all the reasons Joel Osteen's a pagan. I'm going, I don't get it. I don't get it. I don't get how you get that far off that you can read the same Bible I'm reading and not uh, and, and, and come up with some of the, the accusations. I thought, well, I'm just going to listen to a few of his accusations to see if they're so in, in such gray areas that he has a, uh, that he's got a legitimate reason to be confused about it. And the things that he was saying that Joel says are things I've said, the things I believe. Like, you've got a miracle in your mouth. What you say has an impact. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. I'm going, what's wrong with that? I mean, I couldn't find anything that was, that was far off enough to be classified as a pagan. 
and as, a, as of the devil. And so as, you, as we walk this out and let God do what he wants to do in the church, just remember there's voices throwing in the opinions of the enemy to mess it up, to steal, kill, and destroy, and keep God from being able to accomplish in his church what he wants to accomplish. So let's look at um, uh, Luke chapter 6, verse 12 through 16. I just want to make it real clear to you that I believe, and, I'm, and it's true, the original 12 apostles are unique. <clears throat> they were chosen by Jesus to be with him, to, witness, to be witnesses of his death, burial, and re resurrection, and ascension. And in Luke chapter 12, I mean, sorry, Luke chapter 6, verse 12, it says, Now it came to pass in those days that he went out to the mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, he called his disciples to himself. And from them he chose twelve, whom he also named apostles, Simon, who he also named Peter, and Andrew, his brother, and James, and John, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus. And Simon called the zealot, and Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who also became a traitor. So very clearly, Jesus chooses 12 specific men from a crowd of disciples. Now in that crowd, according to what happens later, it seems to be uh, very clearly that Matthias was in that group because Matthias had been with them from the time Jesus was baptized by John through his crucifixion, there at his burial, there at his resurrection, and there at his ascension. And so in Acts chapter 1, when Peter uh, brings two, two candidates to replace Judas and says, let's choose between these two, their qualifications had to be that they were there from the beginning, that they had witnessed the same thing the 12 had witnessed. In fact, without a doubt, I'm convinced, I can't find a scripture for it, that Matthias and the other one, I think it was uh, Josias or somebody like that, were probably part of the 70 that were sent out. So you had the 12 going out, heal sick, raise dead, cast out demons, declare the kingdom has come nigh unto you. And then in the next chapter, he sends out 70. And so these guys were right there on the spot, ready. One of them was ready, and they chose Matthias. So Matthias is the 12th then that replaced the, the betrayer, Judas, who Jesus had purposely chosen uh, because of the fulfillment, to have the fulfillment of the scriptures. That initial group of 12 is fixed and will never be added to. I'll never read all those names and then add Dan Blackshire to the name, uh, to the list. I'll never add uh, uh, Dwight Weatherford to the list. That list is fixed. In fact, it says in Revelations 21, 14, now the wall of the city had 12 foundations and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Only 12. But as Jesus ascended, he, he gave, Ephesians 4, small a apostles to the church. So uh, it's so clear that these did not have the status of the 12, but they were definitely apostles. In the New Testament writings, 13 of them are referred to by name and called apostles. You're the most, one you're most familiar with is probably the Apostle Paul who said, I was as one untimely born but yet an apostle called of Jesus Christ. So if you believe it's only the 12 and there's no other apostles, you already got to deal with Paul who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. I mean, give me a break. Then there were others. Revelations 2.2 says, that I know your works. Jesus is saying to the church of Ephesus, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested or tried or discerned those who say they are apostles and are not and have found them to be false or to be liars. And so Jesus is commending the church of Ephesus that they are testing and discerning who is a real apostle, which you wouldn't have to do if there was just the twelve. There's 12 and no more. It's everybody else that claims to be one is not one. There's no big deal. There's no big test. There's no big discerning that has to happen. But Jesus is commending them for doing that. So I want to look at some of the characteristics of an apostle. In 2 Corinthians 12, verse 12 and 13, it says this. Truly the signs of an apostle 
were accomplished among you with all perseverance in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. For what is it in which you were for what is it in which you were inferior to other churches except that I myself was not burdensome to you? Forgive me this wrong. And so Paul is being sarcastic. He said, look, other churches have these, you know, they got their names up in lights that they have, we're of Apollos, we're of Peter, you know, we're with Jesus. And, you know, they had that, they had that, dis, that disagreement going on of who had the best apostle. And he said, well, forgive me that I didn't put more of a burden on you while I was with you. And uh, I'll do it different next time. But uh, in what area, since I was your apostle, in what area did you really lack compared to the other churches? And they, they didn't have one. So uh, he was being sarcastic with him. But he, in doing so, he identified two apostolic virtues that sometimes we overlook. And one is perseverance or endurance. And the other is not being burdensome to the saints. So a true apostle is not in it for what he can get out of it. He's not in it to take advantage of you. He's not in it to manipulate you, to get you to do things that the Lord doesn't have for your life. A, a true apostle has to press through some things, has to, be, uh, um, has to endure some things. A true apostle doesn't quit when things get tough I think some of the men that have been leading churches for years 25 30 years have the same pressures as those who led them for two and a half years and resigned I, I look at it and I say that may be an apostle there because he's, he's just he just bowed up and he ain't quitting you know I, I used to run uh, long distance before it was cool and um, you know now long distance put on some nice thick shoes won't beat your legs up and feet up and you run miles and miles and do all these marathons that's all cool today but back when I was running we had asphalt track and little cardboard thin soles with three cleats on the front and the coach would put you in long distance for punishment me being somebody who couldn't avoid a, a good opportunity to be sarcastic or something like that I ended up long distance in track, two miles, running on that pavement, hot, just your feet beating the pavement, nothing but a little thin cardboard soles between them. And so uh, I was a freshman and I was running against seniors because I started getting in trouble early uh, with my mouth. <clears throat> and uh, he put me in the varsity, put me every long distance thing he could. He was just like, I'm going to fix you, you know. And so... Uh, here we go, and I placed fifth in the varsity, and then I, then I placed third, then uh, and I became, I became competitive for him. And uh, he took me aside one time. He said, "Hurdle," he said, "You've got no no form. You've you've got no style." He said, "I don't even know how you do it." He said, "You just don't quit." I said, well, I didn't think he was supposed to quit. <laughs> but you know, someone would start out fast and set the pace, and then they'd fall back. Well, I'd just start out whatever and stay that way. And I'd check out mentally. And I'd be fishing for bass or something, but my body would be... <laughs> <laughs> Apostles don't quit. They may, have to, they may have to detour. They may have to... Uh, take a bend in the road but it's not an end in the road for them and so it's one of the one of the characteristics the uh, others that he lists are signs wonders and mighty deeds and oh man am, am I hungry to see that uh, and hopefully in varying degrees as we contend for those things those will become more normal than rare but if you, if, I, I hear great ministers who I've read some of their books and I appreciate their, their giftings, but they teach thousands of people that miracles, signs, and wonders are rare today. Well, if they're rare today, it just makes me have to have that much more faith to get healed. And I don't appreciate them saying that. I think they're rare because we haven't gone after them with the, with the uh, 
enthusiasm and the dedication that we've gone after some other things. But there was a day when Martin Luther stepped up that it was rare to get saved in church. You couldn't even go to church and believe for your salvation. And he said, I want to change that. And for 500 years now, you can, you can get saved anywhere. They're leading them to the Lord in the parking lots. But the church made a shift, and I think there's going to be a shift in the church to where getting healed is going to be more the norm than the abnormal. But it's going to be because we say we're going to contend for this. We're going to go after this. Well, it's not happening. Well, then we're not going to change our theology to match our experience when the experience doesn't match the Word. Jesus said, John 14, 12, the things I have done, if you're believers, you will do also. And greater things than these will you do. Man, you've got to deal with what the Word says and keep going, keep, keep trying, not quitting. I heard of, and I want to tell this because it's, just, it's a testimony that I've never forgotten. When we first started running with the, the Bethel Ministry in uh, Redding, California, there was a testimony of a couple teenage boys that would pray for a man that was in a wheelchair every Sunday morning. And he had a, an, an issue that, that uh, he would never be healed. And he wasn't ever supposed to walk. But every Sunday morning, they'd pray for him. Two years, every Sunday morning. And one Sunday morning, he got up and walked. I guess those two boys are apostles. I don't know. They just, they just wouldn't quit. But if somebody had taken them aside and said, hey, look, it's not happening, uh, let me show you in the Bible where this is probably not for today your experience and my understanding, you know, it's not for today. And then they'd have quit. And he'd never been healed. Let me tell you another one. There was a young lady that was in the worship time at Bethel, and she had scoliosis so bad she had a, a, a shoe built up two inches. She was in constant pain. She was in her uh, late teens, early 20s, and God touched her in a worship service and took away the pain. Still bent, still needing a two-inch shoe, no pain. She got a two-inch built-up running shoe made and ran marathons in no pain. So crooked, she needed a two-inch shoe. Two years later, she's in a worship service. God straightens her out. You say, well, God, what are you doing? You're just messing with us? I don't, I don't know. But if she, had, if she had quit believing that God wants to make it right and wants to complete it, then she'd have missed out. But we serve a great God, and we serve a God that says, you will see signs and wonders and miracles to confirm the word and to confirm that when you say the kingdom of God is at hand, it is. And, and it, here's the demonstration of it. Immature Christians tend to see someone speaking boldly and with authority as being arrogant. And they hold people accountable. And, and the fact that they hold people accountable as them being controlling. They just, they just don't get how... I wrote a letter one time explaining what the, how the Lord's Prayer, those words, um, Thy kingdom come, your will be done on earth. That, those, those words that, that Jesus used were not petitioning God they were commanding God and I wrote a newsletter to this group I was um, the prayer leader of and, and gave the, the, uh, the Greek meaning of those words and said you know Jesus is, is teaching us a prayer where he's saying I want you to take authority like I would take and I want you to command the kingdom of God to come into this situation on earth and I got a letter back from a guy that he accused me of arrogance and who do you think you are? I suppose if Paul would have commanded his thorn, it would have left rather than asking God to take it away. And he gave me all these scriptures and stuff and rebuked me. But the problem is, I just wrote back to him and I said, look, you've got to deal with Jesus. Jesus is the one that told us when we pray, pray this way. And then he said, command God. Use authority. Use God's, uh, his words were authoritative words. And so that's, that, that's hard to receive. Uh, it, it comes across as a, a, someone who thinks more of themselves than they should, but it's actually a humility 
where you're willing to be misunderstood in order to be obedient and in order to step into what God has for you. Anybody can have a bad day, but beware of those with a pattern of pridefulness, arrogance, self-serving, manipulation, and control. In uh, 2 Corinthians eleven thirteen, 13, he says, For such are false prophets, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. So we see today, it's the thing, it's the rage in the streams we're in. <clears throat> for I, I told Joe the other day, I, I saw this, um, this advertisement for a conference, and then I saw another one and another one. They're just going on all over. But everybody on the, on, on the, in the conference ministering was apostles. And I remember five years ago when they were evangelists and pastors and teachers. And I'm going, did everybody switch their title? Or did God really, I'm, I'm not saying God can't promote someone and give them a, 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 a change the season of their life for what they're called to, but it's become the thing to put that on my title, to make it a title. And it never needs to be a title. Uh, it should be a description of your responsibility, and it should help explain why does David talk the way he does. And you can go, oh, calm down, he's just an apostle. You know, he sees you as a soldier. Well, why doesn't he treat me better? He sees you as a soldier. Are you doing your job? Well, he'll treat you better when you do your job. <laughs> I'm going, okay, where's the pastors at? You know, come in here and help these people. <laughs> Fix them up, get them patched up. We got a war on our hands. We're trying to save a nation here folks <clears throat> and we're doing a it's it's God is turning it around my goodness thank the Lord I want to tell, say though that um, the apostles were not perfect the 12 weren't perfect and if you expect someone in any calling to be perfect especially since you say well they're apostles they're um, listed as top of the pack in the foundation of the church uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 28, first of all, apostles. God has said first in the church, apostles, prophets, teachers, <clears throat> administration gifts, miracle gifts, and he lists all the others. And so we expect more of them, and I'm not saying that uh, someone is not have a stricter judgment when they have more influence and more responsibility. But I'm saying if you per expect perfection, you'll be disappointed all the time. Listen to this. I don't know if you realize this or not. But uh, Galatians, <coughs> we won't go there, but Galatians chapter 2, Paul rebuked Peter in front of everyone in the church for hypocrisy that was driven by the fear of man uh, because he would eat with the Gentiles until the Jews showed up, and then he would eat only with the Jews and, and reject the Gentiles. And sweet, sweet Barnabas, joined in with him. And Paul rebukes both of them. These two great apostles. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul couldn't get one of his apostolic team leaders healed. He said, Arasta stayed in Corinth, but Trophimus I have left it mild to sick. Just left him there sick. He said, well, Paul, you should have stayed there until he was well. Well, you, I don't know. I mean, but that's, that was what was going on. Acts chapter 15, Paul and Barnabas, it says, had no small dissension and dispute with those teaching circumcision is still needed. But Paul then doesn't give Timothy a break, who was a Gentile, and he's going into the temple, and he said, Timothy, go get yourself circumcised. I'm going, Timothy's going, what you just said, it, was, it didn't matter. <laughs> Come on, Paul, what's the deal? Paul says, well, they're all going to get mad at us if you don't. He said, well, yeah, sure. You're the one. You don't have to. I mean, like the, like the pig and the chicken, you know. You're going to give an egg. I've got to give a ham, you know. <laughs> There's a little difference here. Acts chapter 16, Paul, um, uh, had, uh, let's see, Paul wanted to have him go with him, and he took him, and, oh, yeah, that's, a, that's where he did the circumcision. Okay, Acts 15, Paul and Barnabas have a contention so sharp over whether John Mark should be depended on when he abandoned them on the other mission journey. They have a, a, a sharp contention, which means they had a knock-down, drag-out 
quarrel. And Paul said, I'm not trusting him again. And, and Barnabas said, sure, you can. I mean, give him a second chance. Give him another chance. I know he's changed. And Paul said, I ain't got time to figure out whether he's changed or not when they're throwing rocks at me. And Barnabas said, Paul, I don't know what to do with you. They split up. It was such a disagreement, they couldn't come to agreement on it. And they went separate ways. Barnabas took John Mark and Paul took Silas, and they went on separate journeys. They couldn't even agree enough to get it back together for the journey. First Timothy... Paul uh, had a, uh, he called him his spiritual son. He said he endured frequent infirmities. And on top of that, now this is Paul's disciple, Paul's spiritual son, enduring frequent infirmities. And Paul says, and, he, and here's Timothy. Hello, Paul. You know, he said, hey, listen, my stomach's really bothering me today. Paul says, hey, listen, why don't you drink a little wine for that? We, wouldn't Paul, did Paul believe in healing, supernatural healing? Well, yeah, he did. But it says Paul recommended that he take a little wine for his stomach's issues. We lost all the Baptists right there. <laughs> Jesus changed water into grape juice. <clears throat> Second Corinthians, Paul says at one point, I even despaired of life. I'm wondering if he is saying in a nice way, a real theological sounding way, I was ready to commit suicide. I was ready to just end it all. I was so depressed. I was so physically down, mentally down, emotionally down. I got down. Anybody ever got down? I was so down. I was so far down. Elijah got so down, he said, God, God kill me. God sent him an angel instead. But he was suicidal. After a big victory. Paul might have been after a big victory, but he might have got beat so down. An apostle like him. Paul had to learn to live with a thorn in the flesh. He was completely dependent on the grace of God, and it was sufficient for him, but he couldn't get rid of it. If you'd have met him and it was something obvious, some say it was just his battles with demonic forces, some say he was almost blind, some say it was an obvious physical infirmity. But if you'd have met him, you could have said, I don't think he's a very big, a strong, powerful apostle. He can't even get rid of his, he, doctor, heal yourself. You can't even get rid of your own issues. Can't even handle your own issues. These guys were human. They had challenges. They weren't so spiritual that they had glorified bodies already. They weren't immune to frustration and failures and neither are those that are called today. But in spite of their weaknesses, because of their efforts, we sit here today, and we appreciate what they sowed into the kingdom, what they gave to the body of Christ, and how God was able to use them despite all that. And we can say with Paul, 2 Timothy 3.11, he said, The Lord has delivered me from it all. And the issues that we are challenged with, His grace is sufficient, and He will deliver us from it all. And don't let them keep you from letting Him use you to accomplish things you didn't dream you could even do, because you can. I'm going to close with this by uh, Charles Carn. Carn, He's, what, 85 years old. He's been ministering to the body of Christ for 50 years. After 30 years of ministry, might be close to 90, in a, in a um, primitive Baptist church denomination where he didn't believe in healing, didn't believe in supernatural, didn't believe in anything except get saved, I guess. And once he got delivered of that, he began to move in signs, wonders, and miracles and has been a blessing to the body of Christ. But he says, are, all, are there apostles today? Yes. These are sent ones to change a culture. They did not volunteer for this ministry, but were called. Are these men infallible? Not at all. But they are aflame with a holy love for Christ and His bride. Do they promote or glorify themselves as apostles? No. They are concerned with truth, not titles. They seek God, not gold. Purity, not praise. Pray for these men. Support these men and women. And from false apostles, turn away. Why don't you stand with me? Thank you, Lord that you've given us an opportunity to flow in a stream 
that emphasizes and receives what you're emphasizing today and being a part of the restoration of the apostle grace gift to your church. And Lord, we just bless those that we know, those you've put in our life. We thank you for them. And we thank you that as pioneers and forerunners, it's not going to be pretty, it's not going to be easy, and it's not going to be without problems, but they are men and women with perseverance and endurance, and they won't back off, and they won't say, I guess we missed it. They'll just keep pushing forward, and we get the privilege of partnering with them as your kingdom advances further and further and more and more, and this last day great harvest is something that will be, we'll get to be a part of it in the lane you've given us to run in and the destiny you've given us to fulfill. And we'll give you all the glory and we give you the thanks. And we're so grateful. And we bless these men and women and we bless the Apostle Grace Gift. Let it manifest in this body and let it manifest across the earth in greater measures. And bless those other Grace Gifts, Lord. And let them just blossom as this order comes into place that you said first the apostle, then the prophet, then the teacher. As the order gets right, Lord, I thank you that the other gifts will excel. And we'll give you the praise and the honor as you lead us in this. In Jesus' name, your people agree and say amen. Amen. God bless you, ministry team. Come down. If you need prayer, you come. Receive prayer.